Hello, everybody. My name is Brendan Mormile, and I'm a PhD candidate at Texas A&M University in the Department of Plant Pathology and Microbiology. I'm speaking with you today on behalf of the JR Biotech Virtual Reach and Teach Scientific Lecture Series. Today, I'm going to be teaching you about the fundamentals of genome editing using CRISPR-Cas9. So for my workshop, I've divided up into two different sections. Today's section, I'm going to be going over some of the basic components of CRISPR-Cas9 and explaining certain characteristics that you need to consider when designing your genome editing experiment using CRISPR. Next week on Friday, November 13th, I'm then going to walk you through some very basic genome editing techniques using web-based CRISPR design tools. I will then conclude next week's workshop with a question and answer section where you will be able to ask me any questions that you have about CRISPR. Now, to begin with, I would like to first go over a basic overview as to what CRISPR-Cas9 is. And in its most simplistic terms, CRISPR-Cas9 is a programmable endonuclease, which is able to induce a double-stranded DNA break at a user-defined region within a host genome. This double-stranded DNA break is then repaired by one of two different innate cellular repair mechanisms. The first mechanism is non-homologous end joining. Now, this is a very error-prone repair mechanism, which often results in the insertion or the deletion of different nucleotides within the break site. These are called indels. Indels can then cause frame shift mutations and ultimately the loss of function of this gene. When this occurs, this is called a knockout. Alternatively, there's the homology-directed repair pathway. Now, this pathway is very accurate and very precise at repairing double-stranded breaks. This is because it uses a repair template. Often, under normal cellular conditions, it uses a sister chromatid or a homologous chromosome. What the researcher can do is include its own repair template. In this example, there's a GFP protein with flanking homologous arms to the break site. When this plasmid is present in close proximity during the repair pathway, it can sometimes be incorporated into the break site. When this occurs, it's called a knock-in. Now, the CRISPR-Cas9 complex consists of two basic components, the Cas9 endonuclease and the God RNA. The God RNA, which can be further subdivided into the God RNA spacer and the God RNA scaffold. The spacer region is basically a 20 nucleotide sequence that is going to be identical to your target region. Now, this spacer region, this 20 nucleotide site, can be any 20 nucleotides that is immediately upstream of a PAM site. That's protospacer adjacent motif. And this is going to be an NGG where N can stand for any nucleotide. So basically upstream of any NGG site. Now, the downstream area of the guide is called the scaffold. Now, this RNA section will fold in on itself and create certain stem loops. These stem loops help it interact with the Cas9, forming the CRISPR-Cas9 complex. When this whole complex scans a host genome, the spacer region will look for a complementarity between its spa uh, spacer region and the host genome. And once it finds it and recognizes it, the Cas9 will be brought into close proximity and able to induce a double-stranded DNA break approximately four nucleotides upstream of the PAM site. Now, when you're working with genes with thousands of different nucleotides, there's going to be a potential of many different guide RNAs that you can choose from. Now, there are three major characteristics that you need to keep in mind when designing your guide. The first one is what is its on-target efficiency? That is, how effective will my guide be at recognizing and inducing a double-stranded DNA break within my target region? Second consideration is its off-target potential. That's what is the likelihood that my guide will cleave a similar target somewhere else within the host genome, creating some undesirable mutation. And then third, target location on the gene. That is, will the double-stranded break at the target location be sufficient at producing the desired genetic modification. So even if you are able to induce a double-stranded break, will it give you the modification that you desire? Now, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about each one of these considerations. 
first on target efficiency. Now, this is largely the use of prediction models and scoring algorithms. What researchers have done in the past is that they've used every single possible guide for a handful of different genes and look for characteristics that were associated with highly effective guides. Some of the things that they saw, some characteristics that they saw was guide RNA sequence composition, specifically nucleotide distribution. They saw that the position of certain nucleotides within the guide was favored over other nucleotides at the same position. For example, when there was a G or guanine, immediately five prime of the NGG PAM site, this was seen as a favorable position, which was associated with a higher, uh, much higher effective guide RNA. Also poly T's or polythymines. Polythymines, multiple thymines in a row can trigger a termination, uh, a termination of transcription when transcription is occurring using a RNA three polymerase. Now, if you have a premature um, transcription, then this can cause a truncated guide RNA, which will result in lack of recognition. Also, RNA secondary structures need to be taken into consideration. If you have a high level of complementarity between the uh, front end and the back end of your guide RNA sequence, this can fold in on itself and cause a undesirable secondary structure that's not gonna interact with your target. Other factors that can be taken into consideration are the GC content. Ideally, you want between 40 and 80% GC. And finally, the guanine immediately three prime of a PAM site is seen as undesirable. Because remember I said the PAM site is NGG, which is any nucleotide for N. So this can create potentially a secondary PAM site, GGG, as opposed to GGN, and can cause a competition for recognition with your guide. Now, the second characteristic is its off-target potential. Now, when a guide scans through a host genome, it's looking for its complementarity between uh, its spacer region and the host genome. Now, it does not have to be 100% identical for it to recognize it. However, Sequence specificity is largely seen to be dependent on the seed region. Now the seed region is 11 nucleotides immediately upstream of the PAM site. Now your guide is going to be much less tolerant of mismatches between the seed region and your spacer. A high level of mismatches within this region will likely result in a hindered Cas9 effect. It will not cleave at this site. However, mismatches within the tail region, which is the final nine nucleotides of your um, target DNA region, is much more tolerant. You can likely get a match in a, a double-stranded break if there are mismatches within your tail region, but not your seed region. So basically, if you have a guide RNA that has less than three mismatches, and specifically these mismatches are within the tail region, then there is a high likelihood of off-target potential. If you have more than four mismatches, and specifically if at least three of these mismatches are within the seed region, then your off-target potential is lowered. And if you have no significant sequence identity um, with any other sites that are immediately five prime of a PAM NGG site, then you have no or very low chance of off-target potential. Now, the third characteristic is target location within the gene. Now, there are a couple areas that you want to pay close attention to avoid. Now, you want to avoid any target sites that are too close to the start codon or the stop codon. This is because you may not target or you may not disrupt the gene enough that you're going to have a successful knockout. Enough of the gene may still be getting transcri uh, transcribed and later translated to form a functional protein. Other sites you want to avoid are alternative splicing sites. You could induce a double-stranded DNA break at a exon that's not even being transcribed um, in the final product. Also, you want to avoid areas that are known to have single nucleotide polymorphisms. This is because that your guide sequence is very specific towards uh, the target region complementarity. If there are any polymorphisms between your guide and a target site, it's likely that it won't be recognized and won't induce any kind of a DNA break. So 
So where do you want to target? Ideally, you would like to target a conserved protein domain. Conserved domains are must, much less tolerant of any kind of uh, variations. Even if you have a single nucleotide difference, this could be enough to uh, hinder the function of whatever the final protein product is and create a successful knockout. Now, I just gave you a lot of information that you need to consider when you design your guide RNA. Luckily, there are many online platforms that you can use that will take all this information into account for you. Now, next week, I'm gonna show you how to use this design software to target two different genes within Arabidopsis. Now, the first technique I'm gonna show you is a knockout of CLELT1 in Arabidopsis. CLELT1 is essential for the chloroplast development, and when you disrupt it, it gives you a very nice albino phenotype. It's very easy to tell when your knockout has occurred. The second technique I'm going to show you is a knock-in of the flag epitope tag into the Arabidopsis transcription factor WORKY18. And basically what I'm going to be doing is showing you how to design a guide RNA that's going to target a very specific region within the host genome and uh, also show you how to design the donor template, which, if um, expressed correctly, should be incorporated into the break site. This is all going to be next week, Friday, the 13th of November. Um, I've also included some additional resources here. I gave you guys a lot of information. I had to do it kind of quickly. Um, if you have any questions, hopefully these videos can dig into a little bit deeper and give you a little bit more explanation to some of the techniques. And also next week, I will be available to answer any questions that you have. Um, I hope you tune in and hope to see you there. Okay, have a great day.